Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Uh, it is good to see all of you. Uh, the Bible verse for the day in the uh, Bible app today is the one who walks in his integrity. No, the righteous who walks in his integrity. Blessed are his children after him. So fathers, thank you for taking steps of integrity that we as your children can walk in. We are so grateful for you. I hope that you feel celebrated today. Uh, there's no football on, but Sixers and Hawks game seven is a close matchup for football, so we'll take it. We are continuing with our series, Growth Under Pressure, which is a study through the book of 1 Peter. And today I want to address the question, how can I tell if I am growing in my faith? I think this is a question that everybody asks at some point in building a relationship with God. How can I tell if my faith is stagnant or if my faith is growing? And the verses that we're going to look at today are from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And if you're following along in the 1 Peter reading study that we're doing this summer, this is day five of what you read this week, it says this, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I want to start this conversation with a core truth that the rest of this talk will be based on, and that is that being a human being involves a constant state of exchange. We are constantly letting go of certain things and taking in others. This is fundamentally true. That just to exist, we are constantly taking in oxygen and letting go of carbon dioxide. It's in our economic systems. We're constantly exchanging products for money and money for products. We learn it when we're really young. I don't know if you guys ever traded cards when you were kids. I was a big fan of trading football or baseball or Pokemon cards. Uh, my nephew right now is full in that phase where he is trading football cards and I offered to him to make an exchange where he uh, he would get my Eric Moulds autographed football card. I don't know how many of you are Buffalo Bills fans that remember Eric Moulds, but he was my favorite player growing up. So I was going to give him my Eric Moulds football card. In exchange, he was supposed to rake leaves at my house. Somehow, this man, who, who's seven years old at this point, ended up baking cookies with Kaylee and I instead of raking our leaves and then ate the cookies that we baked. So not only did he end up with the football card, but he ended up with the baked cookies as well. So perhaps he should be up here giving that message but even in our experiences, uh, long before I learned in economics class what the opportunity cost was, uh, my sister told me growing up, she said, every time you say yes to doing something, you're saying no to everything else that you could do with that time. And so, so we take in experiences and we let go of the experiences that could have happened to take in that one thing. And, and so that's the core truth. Being a human involves a constant state of exchange. And the next step of that is that everything that we take in and let go of, everything that we take in and let go of grows something in us. So what you talked about breathing, oxygen and carbon dioxide, that's the metabolism, the regeneration of cells. When, when, I, when I trade football cards, when Will Sigmund traded me uh, the cookies for his football card, of which he got both, he both grew his football card collection and his cookie collection all at once. When I go to the lake with my wife on a Thursday night, we, that's an investment in our relationship. We take in that experience and it grows our relationship and it grows our bank of memories together. Constant exchanges breed some sort of growth in us. And so this question to be answered of how can I tell if I'm growing in my faith starts with understanding that what grows in us is determined by what things we let go of and what things we take in. And specifically, if we want to grow our faith, there are some things that we need to let go of and there are some things that we need to take in. So that's the framework for this conversation. We're going to talk about what is it that Peter is calling us to let go of and what is it that he is calling us to take in in order for our faith to grow. And then we'll have the chance to look at some measurables, some evidences of faith growth in our lives. So first part, in order for faith to grow, what do we need to get rid of? And this might take some explanation, but... In order for faith to grow, we need to let go of the idolatry of self. The, the first part of this passage says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. And I think the first thing that comes to mind, first thing that came to my mind when I read this was, of course, like th that makes complete sense. No one likes to get lied to. If you've ever been lied to by someone who's close to you, it, it's, no one likes to get lied to. No one likes to be cheated. No one likes to be screamed at or demeaned. It, it, you've not, if you've ever had someone tell you how you should live and then you watch them live another way, you know that that's not a good thing. And of course, it's not good to want what other people have. And so, and so of course, he's telling us to get rid of those things. That makes sense until it doesn't. 
until I'm in a situation where the truth coming out will actually hurt me or where I did something that, that, that if the truth comes to light will actually hurt the people that I care about. And suddenly deceit doesn't seem like quite as big of a deal as it did before that. Or when, I, when I'm saying how important it is to love all of the people in my life and then someone who's really close to me does something that really hurts me and then asks me for my forgiveness. Or they blatantly walk in their lives, they, they do things, they believe things that I don't believe are right. And I know that I am called to speak the truth in love and I know that God has placed me in their lives to love them, but all I actually want to do is tear them apart and tell them that they're wrong and if they're not gonna change, then why should I care about them at all? And then hypocrisy creeps into our lives. Or a situation where you see something that you want and you know you should not have it, but you also know that if you could bend the rules a little bit, you actually could have that thing. And suddenly envy doesn't seem like it's quite as big of a deal. And so here's the thing, Peter wouldn't say that we need to rid ourselves of these things if they weren't a problem in the first place. And it's easy to agree with him that we need to get rid of those until it's not, until it personally affects us. But like I said, everything that we allow in, everything that we allow to live in us grows something in us. So deceit and malice and hypocrisy and envy and slander, deceit grows our desire to be seen in a certain way in the eyes of other people so that we hide certain parts of ourselves in order to be seen, in order to control the way that we are seen. Envy and slander grow our ambition to achieve at the expense of others in a quest for influence and power and authority and possessions hypocrisy and slander grow this understanding in us that we alone are above reproach and our opinions are always correct and anybody who shares a different opinion than what we do should actually be discredited for their opinion alone. And as our ambition and our image and our possessions and our authority, as those things grow, there's an idol that develops in us, but it's actually the idol of self because we have become the focal point and we are the center of the universe. And the problem is that as we are lifted up in our own eyes, our faith is quietly choked out by the idol that we've created. And it doesn't grow, and it doesn't mature, and it doesn't bear fruit. And that seems hopeless, and I'm sorry to start out in a hopeless seeming way, but the reason that it seems hopeless is because if it were up to us, it actually would be, because in order to rid ourselves of these things, as Peter is calling us to, it actually requires for us to have something that matters more to us than our political ideals, that matters more to us than our personal success in this world, that matters more to us than even our reputations with the people around us. We have to have something that can displace the idolatry of self, and that's the good news of scripture is that we are called to let go of these things because there is something far greater for us to take hold to that will actually transform us through the renewing of our mind and will lead to the growth of our faith. So that's the good news this morning. Whew. So that's part one, which is one of the things that we are called to get rid of. But there's this important hinge, I call it. Everything in this passage hinges on one phrase. And so I think it's important, even though it doesn't necessarily fit into either of our categories, it's important to talk about because everything else is based on it. Passage ends and says, you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is a conditional now. So we, we read from the New International Version here at Calvary. Other, other translations of the Bible use the word if. The concept is that if you have experienced the goodness of God, then you can and should let go of these things and take in others. And I think the reason that this is important to, to, to highlight is that you might not feel like you have experienced the goodness of God ever, or you might not feel like you're experiencing the goodness of God right now. It might be that you are in a really crappy situation and there are a lot of bad things happening and you're wondering how could the goodness of God exist in my current situation. And so this is the good news. Uh, the reassuring truth of God's goodness is that it's not dependent on our external situation. And in fact, the people that Peter was writing to in this passage were Christians who had been scattered throughout the entire world by Roman governmental persecution. They were being tortured and killed on the daily for their faith. And yet he insists that they can not just know the goodness of God, but they can taste the goodness of God. And there's an important differential that I want to look at between knowing and believing something in your head and experiencing it and tasting it in your heart. And the difference is relationship. 
relationship demands experience from us. I always use my wife as an example. She loves that. But I could know all the facts in the world about, about my wife, and it would never equate to a relationship with her because a relationship demands experience. I have to know what it's like to speak to her, to listen to her, to sit in silence with her. It demands experience, not just knowledge. And so Peter says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And the Bible is full of people who are in difficult situations and still experience the goodness of God. And it happened in dreams and visions and the, the encouragement and the challenging words of others and in gentle nudges and in still small voices. And God still speaks in those ways today. And now one of the main ways that we can see, that we can experience, that we can taste the goodness of God is through his word, which is his rescue story to us. And I found that it's not always earth shattering moments when we experience God, though sometimes it is. But often for me, I have found that God speaks through a simple thought that comes into my mind and lines up with his word and it contradicts directly whatever I had previously been thinking or feeling about a situation. And I can't put a specific formula to the way that God speaks because I'm not God. So instead, I'm going to give you just a couple quick examples from my life to paint a picture of what that might look like. Uh, this past spring, I was doing a bunch of different things. Uh, my, my days were long, my head was spinning, and it felt like there was uh, just a bunch of different tasks and responsibilities that were swirling around in my head, and I couldn't pin down any one of them. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it feels like there's just all these thoughts swirling around, and you're like, if I could just pin one down, then I could get something going, but I can't. And so I remember I was driving down West Side Drive. I can tell you the specific moment. I was driving down West Side Drive in Chai Lai. I had no radio on in my car. And all of a sudden, I was hit with this urge to praise God. And it made absolutely no sense. And it had nothing to do with anything that I was thinking about. But I just felt this joy and this desire to praise. And the psalm that says, you turn my mourning into dancing and my sackcloth into praise was more real for me than it had ever been in that moment. And it was not a head knowledge because it was something that I felt in my heart. And it didn't come from me because it had nothing to do with what I was experiencing prior to that. It was a taste of God's goodness. That's my fun example. This is my not fun example. Uh, a month ago, I was fighting with my wife, and I went for a run. She, I gave, she gave me permission. Sorry. She gave me permission to tell the story. But I was fighting with my wife, and I went for a run, and I did not make it more than a quarter of a mile before I felt God just slap me across the face with this understanding that my selfishness was affecting our relationship and it was affecting my wife and how clearly I was not portraying the selfless love that Jesus calls us to. And here's the thing that I want to highlight is that that is also the goodness of God. Because it doesn't feel like the goodness of God, but that's the health of my relationship that's being saved by his grace. And that's God's goodness. Amen. Also, the fact that he did it in the first quarter mile was also his goodness because my body was not made to run long distances. I wouldn't have made it that much farther anyways. <laughs> Woo, he had to speak or else I was going to meet him. Um, anyways, so God's goodness is noticeable if we are willing to listen, to make space to listen to what he is saying. And so that, that's kind of our segue into part two. So we talked about what are the things that we are called to let go of. We let go of the idolatry of self and we need this experience of God to base our faith on. But what are the things that we need to take in in order for faith to grow? The verse says, like a newborn, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. This is a simple concept and a difficult practice. In order for faith to grow, we need to internalize and apply the word of God on a consistent basis. Like a newborn, crave pure spiritual milk. I thought about calling this message Got Milk originally, but that got vetoed really quickly. It's not, here's the thing, it's not sexy, it's not catchy, it's true. It's milk. In order for our faith to grow, we need desperately to take in, to internalize, and to apply the word of God consistently. It's critical. And in order to do this, we actually need to crave the Bible. We need to desire the word of God. It says to crave pure spiritual milk. My sister just had a baby literally yesterday. Uh, see if the, uh, do we have the picture? Uh, I was waiting for the collective awe. You can, you can applaud Adela. She's really cute. 
So I'm not an anatomy teacher, but I do know that an infant craves milk. And if you've ever been around a baby that was hungry, you know that an infant craves milk. And they don't even know why they need it. They don't know that they need it to grow. They just know that they need milk. And the difference between infants and us is that Satan has corrupted our growth. He has planted weeds in the gardens of our lives to choke out the things that we should desire so we don't recognize what it is that we actually need to grow. And so getting a taste, coming back to that hinge, getting a taste of the goodness of God, getting an experience of him, what relationship with him is like, whether that be through his word or through a dream or through a vision or however it is that he speaks to you, the relationship is critical because it's that relational experience with God that gives us the foundation and the understanding that there's something better than what we've experienced so far. Tasting God's goodness is how we see that we need to know him more, and it's knowing that need that gives us a craving to take in, to internalize, and to apply his word. It's the craving. And so the other thing is, is that we need it consistently. I, I love, I love that Peter used the, the, the picture of a newborn craving milk because newborns need milk eight to 12 times per day. I learned so much about babies in the process of making this message. I love that he used the analogy of the newborn craving milk because just like a baby needs milk consistently, we need consistency in our study and application of the Bible for our spiritual growth. We cannot grow if we are not nourished. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes it can feel like a chore or it can feel like just another thing or it feels like there's not that much fruit in my life that's coming from consistently reading scripture. But what I want to highlight is that how we read the Bible, evaluation and application is critical to what we take away from that time. It's not just consistent reading, it's consistent life application. And in fact, uh, the Bible says that reading the scriptures and then walking away and not applying what you learned is like looking at yourself in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what you look like. It does nothing to change your life. It does nothing to change you. It's not just consistent reading, it's consistent application. A central part of taking in the word of God is actually taking in the word, internalizing it, but then also asking God to show you the places in your life that he is calling you to change, that he is calling you to see who he is and allow that to transform you. And then when he, when he calls something out on you, when his word challenges something in your life, to actually act on that. That is the application process, and that is critical to the internalization and application of the word of God. And if you want to know more about that, Sarah Sigmund did a less than 10-minute video. It's on our YouTube channel. It's called How Do I Read My Bible and Actually Get Something Out of It? The best resource that I've seen on this topic as far as getting something out of your scripture time and investing in that relationship with God. So once you've experienced the goodness of God, once you've tasted him and once you've felt his love for you and you know what a relationship with him can look like, it makes you want to know him more. And then when you, when you get to know him more, you understand your need for him. And then when you understand your need for him, you come back to his word and you experience him again. And, and, and so it's a cycle. Then you experience him again and it draws you back to your need for him. And then when you realize that you need him, you read his word again and you experience him again. And it's this beautiful circle and it's growth. Stephen, for those, Stephen Nichols, for those of you who are reading in the study today, he calls it sanctification. It's this process of the renewing of your mind as you know and love God more and experience what a relationship with him is actually like. It's the center point of our life. And that's how our faith grows. It says, so that you may grow up in your salvation. So the big question of the day, how can I tell if I'm growing in my faith? So first we talked about what we let go of. Can you, can you notice the things? Are you letting go of the idolatry of yourself? Are you taking in consistently the word of God? But the other thing about this passage is that it starts with the word, therefore. Thematically, it is connected to the end of the passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. So there are three things that I want to look at within the end of 1 Peter chapter 1, three things that Peter calls the believer's lives to look like. And these three things are closely connected to the growth of our faith. I will call them evidences, benchmarks of our faith, that you can, you can ask yourself these three questions as measurables, as uh, evaluations of the necessary areas of your faith to grow. And it might be that you have a different answer for one of these questions in one area of your faith than another, and that's okay. These, these questions can be applied to your, the entirety of your faith. So the first question, have you accepted the salvation that was won for you? 
First Peter chapter one, verses 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And then, then verse 21 says, through him you believe in God, through him being Jesus, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and your hope are in God. So the first measure of growth in your faith is an acceptance and a belief that salvation was won for you when Jesus came down and lived a sinless life on earth and died a death that we deserve and that God raised him from the dead and he is seated in eternity with God. And so because of that and because of that alone, we have both eternity in heaven and purpose on earth found solely in Jesus. And this demands humility from us because it removes the notion that we could somehow possibly be responsible for either our own salvation or for our own growth. And it's not a one-time thing. I think oftentimes we believe that, well, we just made that, we accepted our salvation one time. Humility requires over and over from us for us to accept that it is Jesus and Jesus alone that we depend on. It's not a, humility is not a one-time thing. We continue to learn it over a lifetime. And when we humbly accept Jesus as the source of our salvation, when we come back to the humility of knowing what he did for us, it alleviates the weight of redemption from our shoulders because now we can have relationship with him. And now we can bring all of those awful things, all of our envy and all of our malice and all of our deceit and all of our hypocrisy, and we can lay them at the feet of Jesus. And we can receive what I call a holy exchange where we give him all of those broken things and we give him our desire to follow him. And in exchange, he gives us grace and he gives us forgiveness and he gives us mercy and he gives us purpose and we get eternity. So the first question, have you accepted the salvation that was won for you in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? And if you haven't, why haven't you made that decision yet? I just encourage you to evaluate that question. If you want to talk to me, I would love to talk to you. I'll be in the lobby after service. Uh, if you're online this morning, you can go to our website. There's way more information there and our contact information. We would love to have a conversation with you about that. So first question, have you accepted the salvation that was won for you? Second question of our faith, do you love others deeply? First Peter chapter one, verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. So I think, what does it mean to love someone deeply? And I, and I come back to that verse where it says, you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another. This is love based on obedience to the word of God, which again comes back to everything that we've talked about, the, the importance of the intake, the relationship with God. This is love based on his words. It's not based on our feelings. It's not based on the common ground that we share with someone, and it's not based on what they have done towards us. This is the love that God has displayed throughout all all of eternity for us. We see it first in our relationship with him, this love that is based on truth. And so one of the marks of a growing faith, if we are internalizing and applying the word of God, is that our love starts to look like his love. And again, it's not based on our rule following. It's based on the relationship and seeing how much he loves us. Eventually, that has to impact the way that we talk to other people. I had a mentor in my life that said, show me your five best friends and I'll show you what your future looks like. The more that we spend time with God, the more we become like God. So the more that we take in and understand the depth of his love, the more we will begin to show that love to others, not based on what they do and not based on what we have in common, but based on God's love. So second question, where in your life are you currently loving others, not based on their actions or your feelings or your shared interests, but based on an obedience to the truth of God's love and on his love for you? And it, even if you are doing this, there's a solid chance that someone came into your mind this morning who you are not showing that kind of love to. And I, I'm guessing that because it happened to me when I was writing this. If you're not doing that with someone, what can you practically do this week to show them that you love them even when it's not easy? Can you, can you say something to them in person or on the phone or via text message that reminds them that you're not keeping a record of the things that they've done wrong and you're not basing your love for them on that? Can you show them with an action that your love extends beyond the pain that they have caused you? Where in your life are you loving others deeply? 
And the third question that I think you can ask to evaluate the growth, the evidence of faith, is do you live for a purpose beyond yourself? This is the end of 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, For all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Our society right now will tell you that there is no higher purpose than pursuing your opinions and pursuing your success and pursuing your influence and pursuing your possession and your authority and your power. And I hope that those things sound familiar because those are the same things that come to us when idolatry of self is inside of us. When our faith is growing, when we are taking in the word of God, our desires begin to take a backseat to the purpose of the word of God, which Jesus gives us in Matthew 28. Go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's that relationship again. When our faith is growing, then seeing others transformed by the grace of God begins to matter more than having our opinions heard. And committing to love them unconditionally begins to matter more than gaining a position of authority. And building a relationship becomes more important than acquiring an achievement. And it's not that these are bad things in and of themselves. I want to clarify that. But when our faith is growing, when the the eternal purpose of God, of making disciples, when that is our priority, these things just take a back seat naturally to it. Because here's the truth. When, When your authority position fails... And when you don't achieve what you wanted to achieve, and when your opinion ended up being wrong after all, some of you are like, I'm not there yet, but one day you will. One day you'll have a wrong opinion. When all those things fail, the word of God is still lasting, and it's still eternal, and it's still transforming lives, and it's still making us healthier, and it's still making us fuller on into eternity in relationship with God. And that is an eternal purpose. Amen? That is an eternal purpose. So where in your life are you actively engaging with living a purpose that is bigger than you? And if you can't think of something right now where you're like, oh, yes, I'm clearly doing this thing. It's contributing to the purpose of God. If you can't think of that, I'm not here to condemn you. I have too many things going wrong in my own life to be able to condemn you for that. But I am here to give you a challenge. After service, head out to the lobby. There's a table out there with two gentlemen who will be behind it. Uh, They tell them that you want to either serve in the church or you want to serve in the community. And and you want to be connected to a purpose that is bigger than you. And they will get you practically connected with a way right now to to today, within the next couple weeks, to begin to serve a purpose that is bigger than you than you. And honestly, it doesn't even have to be through our church. Oh, by the way, if you're watching online, you can go to rcalvary.org slash serve and have the same conversation and find a way to engage with purpose bigger than you. And it doesn't even have to be through our church, but just find somewhere in your life that you can connect with the purpose of making disciples of Jesus. Engage with his eternal purpose. This is the measurable of our faith. Are we loving others deeply? Have we accepted the salvation that was won for us? Do we live with an eternal purpose in mind? I'm going to call the worship team back out. We're going to close. So I gave you a few different action steps there, and and, and I encourage you with the living out of your faith and the measurables. I encourage you to take those if you felt like that was something that God is calling you to this morning. But I also want to give you a clear action step in growing up in your salvation, as 1 Peter talks about in our passage today. Take this summer and study the book of 1 Peter. There is more about accepting salvation that was won for you and the way that that affects our lives. There is more about how to love others deeply. There is more about living for a purpose beyond yourself, and it's all wrapped up in this book. And you have the resource here for you if you want to study it. And if you don't have one yet, go to the Welcome Center after service and say, I would like to study the book of 1 Peter, and they will give you a free resource to study the book of 1 Peter. Peter. And if you're online, you can go to rcalvary.org slash one Peter. And the same resource has been specifically formatted for online so that you can do this as well. Commit this summer to growing up in your faith 
to the process of sanctification, to the renewing of your mind, to the growth of your faith with a God who never abandons you and never forsakes you. Would you stand with me? Because we're going to worship. So here's the truth. God is calling us to replace the idolatry of self with the truth of his word, not because he wants to control us, but because he sees the fuller life on into eternity in relationship with him that we could have. And he wants desperately for that to be ours. Lean into the word of God. Lean into a relationship with him. This is the core of what we believe. His desire is to show you more grace and more love than you have ever experienced in your life. And then his desire is for you to share that grace with a world that so desperately needs it. And you are not doing this alone because you have a heavenly father who wants to be in a relationship with you and who will never forsake you and who will never abandon you. So would you sing this truth with us today. Not for a minute was I forsaken.